Må jeg da være? Nej. Where do I begin? So, okay. I guess we should start from the beginning, which would be when we wrote the language. And what was the motivation for the language? So we were at Facebook. It was four guys. Um, we were in the developer experience team. It's called a developer experience team, but it was it was more about the bottom line was about efficiency and um, and performance. So we wanted to make sure that all the different teams um, were working at their best. And one of the issues that we saw was that there was just a code quality problem where people were writing code that was hard to maintain. Um, you know, even though they were using a variety of different languages, we found that it was very hard to inculcate a culture of code quality and have everybody on the same page about what constitutes good code. That just wasn't going anywhere. So we decided, um, you know, we should talk to Mark. So I talked to Mark and I said, you know, I think we need to spend a bit more time on on properly addressing this issue. Um, we had done like a scattershot approach, that, you know, thus far. But I, I went to Mark and I said, you know, can we write our own language? Um, we thought that it would be a good opportunity to kind of take all the things that we had learned throughout our quite long careers at this point and distill it into a, uh, a language where you can write code that is performant, um, high quality, but most importantly, you know, we wanted the experience of writing the code to, to kind of reignite that spark. You know, I think a lot of us all have, have memories of when we first discovered programming, whether it was back in, you know, pr for me, it was primary school, making video games. Some of my friends, it was high school. Some of them didn't really get there until uni, but we all had the same experience that in the, in the early days, there is that magic. And I think that, you know, over time, people lose that sense of magic um, because I, I think as they learn about how to, how to write code within the confines of their language, I think they find that it becomes very constrictive and, um, and they start to feel like they're fighting against the language. So we, you know, we had a two month, um, runway to basically say, let's see what we can do in two months. Um, and, uh, it was just the four of us, you know, kind of in the same area in the office and we just saw what we could do. And, um, two months go by and, you know, the stakeholders are kind of getting a bit, bit nervous about the time that it's taken and, you know, the deadline's looming. And I, you know, I brought the guys into a meeting and said, you know, how do we feel about it? Do we feel like it's ready to kind of be released and, you know, we can get a couple of internal teams working within the language and we all decided like, you know, this, this language has great features and we set out designing it to, to have certain features that we wanted it to have, but it's, it's actually missing something. And when we brainstormed it, um, we effectively landed on the conclusion that we had taken the wrong approach. So, you know, you shouldn't write a language where you've got like five or six ideas in your head about nice features to add to that language and um, just certain aspects about how you would program in that language, you should instead forget about that shit, throw that all away and focus on principles and values. What are the values you want to be embedded in that language and to therefore be embedded in programs written in that language? So, you know, we, we knew we wanted things to be minimalistic. We think that modern day languages have far too many abstractions. We wanted to give the, the, the programmer only that which they need to write great code as opposed to what they want. Because when you give people what they want, first of all, there's no end to what an individual wants. And second of all, different people want different things. And so you end up, you know, you could end up with a language that just has a bunch of random shit that no one really cares about. And it makes it hard to understand what's going on when you're coming onto a new project. So... You know, it was a tough conversation. I called up Mark. He was, it was like 7 p.m. I think he was having dinner with his family and just said, hey, can we take a bit longer? We want to st start again from scratch. We had about 100,000 lines of code at that point. Um, and, you know, he said, okay. And that, there was the, there was a slight inflection as he said that, um, which kind of begged the question, you know, 
okay, but you know, I'm giving you the I'm giving you the I'm giving you the space that you need to create a great language here, but there is that uncertainty. And that was actually the inspiration for the name of the language. Okay, with a question mark. The reason for that is because it's the, it's in the question mark that the magic lives, the excitement. You don't know whether this new language is actually going to become worthwhile or just be chucked in the trash. No one knows. But it is the unknown that is exciting about it. And so that's that's the, the um, origin of the actual name. So we started over. We started from principles and we extrapolated to features rather than going the other way around and you know we're approaching the deadline again and it happens again we get in a meeting we say it's actually it's just it's not right it's still not right the it's it was like 99.9 percent there And the reason that we all still felt that unease about it, it wasn't like it was incomplete and we had to just go and add more things to fix it. There was still something fundamental that wasn't right about it. And what we had discovered is we, you know, we we think about other languages like Java, you know, languages that are very, you can, you can tell by looking at the language that it was written in a hierarchical context. You've got inheritance in Java, you've got, um, these taxonomies. It's like we think about a big org chart. Um, we found that by being embedded within a corporate context or writing a language, we could not help but uh, we we couldn't help but kind of permeate some of that uh, corporate context into the language itself, and we feared that we would have the same, we'd be making the same mistake that all these other languages have made that we're trying to get away from. So, you know, you think about most um, popular modern languages today, they're typically backed by a big company because they've got the capital to spend on that. So you've got Go with Google, um, Rust started out with Mozilla, um, TypeScript and the React framework and Microsoft. So we said, hang on, React's in Facebook, isn't it? Anyway, as much as we loved Facebook, we had to walk away from that to really capture what what, what had become our mission for quite a few months at that point, which is to, to change the needle on the culture of programming. So, you know, I talked to Mark and said, we're going to have to, we're, we're going to resign. The, t- the whole team resigned. It was four guys at the beginning and we, we had a fifth come in um, about halfway through. We all resigned. We all went to my friend's uh, garage and just started... Um, from scratch once again threw away another hundred thousand lines of code and um you know the rest is history you know i had no idea at the time you know the initial intention was let's just try and change the culture within within this company facebook that we were in um but i had no idea at the time it would become as big as it is now and i feel like i i feel like the decisions we made had we not made the decision to to step away from the corporate environment and kind of go and do it, you know, in an isolated garage um, in rural Australia, I don't think that we could have had that same success. Right? Yes. Okay. Quinton. Yes. Quinton? Question mark. So that's an interesting that's an interesting story there. So so what happened with Quinton was we knew that we needed a mascot. So not every language has a mascot, but think about you know. Um, Rust has that little crab thing and and the the Go language has gophers and, um, you know, I was inspired by seeing the female butterfly from the Raku language, which is the successor to Perl. I think it's Perl 6 or something like that. Um, You know, seeing the the conscious decision to kind of take a social issue, such as, you know, women being underrepresented in STEM, um, and and capture that in the mascot, that actually had an influence on me. So, so... I obviously that language crashed and burned, but um, I wanted to try and take it to, uh, to the next step. So you know, we I just had a sketch. Uh, initially, we weren't thinking about any of this stuff. We're just like we need to have a mascot. But um, I had a sketch of just a big red question mark with eyes and a mouth, and you know, it's just funny, yeah, Quentin question mark. Um, but Rob, our graphic designer, um, he when he vectorized it, and because um, I just had like a crappy, you know on a piece of paper, but he vectorized it, professionalized it. And, you know, looking at the, the result, you could see in um, Quinton's eyes a, 
you know, it, it was hard to hard to hard to describe. It's kind of a malaise or um, maybe fear or melancholy, but there is there is an unease um, in his eyes. And um, you know, when I saw that, I just thought this is the perfect opportunity to um, to do something special with this with this character. And at that point, it really was about being a character. Like, you know, you think about most mascots. Who are they? What's their backstory? You're, not, you're never going to find out. We wanted to change that. So what we wanted to do here is, is to combine all these ideas about, you know... So, like, think about... Um, some people have the idea that a language should be written in isolation of whatever the social zeitgeist and the problems of the era are. And I strongly disagree with that. I think that... You can't separate a language from the social environment um, in which it is found and in which it is created. And so I wanted to give this mascot some traits which reflected what was happening in, in, in modern times. So, you know, Quentin has depression, effectively. Um, we wanted to have a narrative structure to this mascot. So... I think depression is a, is a topic that isn't really discussed enough. You know, I've had depression, I think probably either a majority or a large minority of my friends currently have depression. Um, and, you know, probably about 30 to 50% of them are currently on antidepressants. So this is an issue which afflicts, you know, a lot of people, um, especially with economic... I mean, like, there's, there's m multiple issues, but a lot of things are conspiring right now to make the lives of, of people... Um, suck quite a bit and what we wanted to do with Quentin is kind of say okay you've got a question mark who is immortal um, has eyes but no eyelids um, and is kind of separate to the physical world so there, he has no physical form he's purely digital um, you know what does that does that take a toll on a person um, or in this case a question mark to be that kind of to be that kind of being and to live through life where, you know, anyone that you ever have an emotional attachment to eventually passes away. What we want to see with Quentin is him exploring that and kind of learning the effects of, you know, whenever you run a program, he's, he's saying something about how depressed he is, you know, saying, I don't think anyone gives a shit about me, things like that. So I think that, um, you know, and then there's also about attachment issues. So, like, if somebody says that they're going to self-harm if you leave them, is that them sincerely expressing their internal pain or is that a bargaining chip to retain control over you? And the answer is it's a bit of both. So, we want to take Quentin and explore all these themes in a narrative structure that is progressed as the language itself progresses. So, the idea is that, you know, maybe... OK version 1.1 comes out and all of a sudden Quentin has a slightly different personality. He's got a different um, situation in his narrative arc and you'll kind of be given bits and pieces of information about that um, when you run programs. So maybe like one out of five times you run a program, you'll see at the bottom Quentin question mark says and he'll just give a little bit of a um, diatribe about uh, what's happening in his life at that point in time. So we're very excited about that. Um, it's really the first time it's been done in any programming language, and I hope that it becomes a model for other languages to build upon. You know, it's been it's been a great experience doing it. We've we've gotten called up. Satya Nadali called me. He was saying, you know, I heard that Mark was sad to let you go, um, but uh, you know, if you guys need any funding, you can you can talk to me. And I said, it's don't worry about it. Like when you're in a garage with four other guys and. Um, you're all on the same page and you're, you're doing something which you know will make the world a better place, money becomes completely irrelevant. So, you know, he was saying, do I need to get Bill Gates on the phone? What has to happen here? How do we make this work? And I was just, it was the kind of thing where I think that he knew. And when I explained exactly what I've just told you, you know, when I explained that to him, um, he, he got the message and he said, okay. And, you know, you hear that word and it just keeps coming back again and again. It's like going full circle. That word is so powerful because it communicates understanding. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's really what this language is about. It's about building understanding, creating a great languages and, um, and kind of rebooting the industry in a way that allows us to start writing great code again um, and feeling the magic again. So 
um, yeah, that's really all I have to say.